introducing our speaker today, uh, Celia Barra, who's uh, uh, at Carnegie, but also a regular here uh, for the last semester or so. And so many of us have gotten a chance to know her, and hopefully for those who haven't, it's a chance to, to do so. Um, Celia uh, did her undergraduate at, at Tel Aviv University, and I thought it was, uh, I didn't know this until I looked at your resume, but uh, was a, a bachelor's in both physics and electrical engineering. Specialization in signal processing and electro optics, and then did her PhD at uh, Tel Aviv with Hagar Netzer, uh, where she was incredibly prolific, uh, writing you know, like 25 papers uh, as a student, or on 25 papers, and many of which were high impact, uh, winning numerous awards in multiple categories for teaching and research, including John McCall Prize, and uh, Vladimir Schreiber Prize for Excellence in Research. And Adams Fellowship and Ashley Perez Prize and others. Uh, her work was recognized she was, in many ways. She was invited to write uh, a co author a book on intelligent astrophysics, uh, invited as a lecturer. If you can tell us what that means, perhaps. But uh, uh, as a lecturer at uh, three different uh, summer or winter schools in astrophysics as a student, and uh, uh, really a rising, the rising star in astroinformatics, and demonstrated both by but also by the fact that the lecture notes from uh, one of these winter schools uh, just posted on archive as uh, uh, machine learning and astronomy, a practical guide already has something like 130 citations in the literature and is widely used as had it recommended by multiple external people for new students getting into the field as a primary. In addition to that, she's in the PI of many different observing proposals with its concerns ranging from news to XMM to ALMA and other uh, classical observing programs, as well as her work on um, machine learning, uh, astrophysics, and astronomy. Uh, and look forward to hearing more about your science. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Great. Um, OK, so thanks, Phil, for this uh, introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a subject not related at all to machine learning. This is my actual uh, mo mostly related to what I've been studying during my PhD. Um, and it's related to the role of AGN feedback in galaxy evolution. Um, so to set up the stage, um, so I want to talk about galactic flows. Uh, these flows, uh, traced either uh, by absorption or by emission, have been detected since the early 90s. Um, here I'm showing uh, not the first example, but I really like this example, uh, and I'll explain why in a second. What you're seeing here, this is a spectrum, an optical spectrum of NGC 4945. You can see the galaxy here. And if we look at the optical spectrum close to the sodium doublet absorption wavelength, we can see two different components. Uh, I mark with purple, pink, the systemic velocity of the stars in the galaxy. So we see this uh, doublet absorption of neutral gas close to systemic velocity. But in addition to that, we see this doublet blue shifted by roughly 500 kilometers per second. And I call these features enigmatic because it is very challenging from observations such as this to understand what is the nature of this intervening gas. So we do know what is the velocity shift with respect to the systemic velocity of the stars. And we also know that this gas is located between the galaxy, the stars, and the observer. But we can ask various questions. For example, where is this sodium absorbing gas? Is it on parsec scales? Is it on kiloparsec scales? Is it on tens of kiloparsec scales? What is the size of the absorbing cloud? Is it this size or is it much larger? Uh, is it uh, distributed like uh, tiny cloudlets with some filling factor? So all of these things are things which are rather challenging to, to uh, understand from observing this integrated spectra. Um, in addition to this, here we see uh, an absorption by neutral uh, sodium, but does this cloud also uh, include some ionized component or some molecular component? So what is the excitation and ionization state of this gas? How much mass is there? So all of these questions 
are challenging to answer, and this is why I call these features enigmatic. But since then, fast forward to present days, we now understand that galactic flows are an extremely important process in galaxy evolution. We know that gas inflow uh, power star formation and galaxy growth in the galaxy. And we also know that there are outflows that reaching uh, very uh, large scales from the galaxy. Some of this gas is also recycled back in. A very complex picture of inflowing and outflowing gas that is shaping the evolution of a galaxy. And here are just two examples. There are multiple, many, many observations of these flows on different scales. Here I am showing you one example of different absorption features, uh, blue shifted with respect to systemic velocity, so gas that moves towards the observer versus an emission line that is red shifted. This is from close, uh, basically from spectra of uh, the galaxy itself. Whereas on large scales, if we probe, for example, some light source, that passes through the circumgalactic medium, the gas on hundreds of kiloparsec scales, we see this very complex absorption features tracing multiple kinematic components on very, very large distances. So we see that from very small scales to very large scales, and we now believe that these galactic flows have a significant impact both on the larger scales of the galaxy and on the smaller scale. So here I'm showing you examples of metals detected uh, on hundreds of kiloparsec scales from a galaxy. You can see here, this is, for example, magnesium-2 absorption equivalent weight in different galaxies, a function of uh, distance. Here you can see uh, silicon-3. Here is another paper summarizing the detection of uh, different species to very large distances from the center the galaxy. There is a problem here. You can't hear me? Okay. Maybe you should turn this one off and if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Oh, it's not working either. One, two, three, okay. um, oh, it seems to, there's maybe some interference. Do you have a phone in your pocket? No, but maybe my clock. It's working now. Is it okay now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Okay. Uh, let me know if it uh, comes back, the noise. It does. Yeah, okay. Uh, like this is okay? All right. Okay, sorry. Okay. So on very large scales, we detect these metals to very large distances from the galaxy. And the question is, how did these metals reach these distances? Uh, galactic flows are the suggested process that basically moves uh, this metal-enriched gas from centers of galaxies to uh, their circumgalactic medium. From very large scales, I now move to very small scales. Uh, we now know that massive galaxies host supermassive black holes in their center, and we know that there exists a correlation between the mass of these supermassive black holes and various properties of the host galaxy. Here I'm showing the M-sigma relation tying the black hole mass to the stellar velocity dispersion, so stars moving on kiloparsec scales within a galaxy. And we find this very tight correlation between these two properties, uh, which by itself was rather surprising because the supermassive black hole in the center, its gravitational potential is not strong enough to affect how the galaxy will look like on kiloparsec scales. So we need some process that connects the growth and evolution of the supermassive black hole with the growth of the host galaxy and the properties of host galaxies on kiloparsec scales. And galactic flows have been suggested as a process that connects these two uh, growth uh, mechanisms. Um, so within galaxies, we have these supermassive black holes, which sometimes accrete matter through an accretion disk of gas and dust. And this accretion disk emits radiation throughout the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We see it 
uh, we see these sources uh, for very large distances, and we call them active galactic nuclei, AGN. And one of the suggested processes is a process in which the AGN, when the supermassive black hole accretes, drives outflows from the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, and these outflows are believed to propagate to galactic scales, affect the uh, gas in the galaxy, maybe even push out molecular clouds or destroy them, and by that, forming some mechanism of feedback between the growth of the supermassive black hole in this AGN phase and the growth of the host galaxy. Another important uh, component uh, are hydrodynamical simulations of galaxy formation. Uh, we now reach the point where simulations of galaxy formation are able to reproduce a large variety of observed properties of local massive galaxies. You do not need to go through all of them here, but these are different observed properties of uh, massive uh, galaxies in the local universe, whether their uh, stellar mass function, the mass metallicity relation, uh, the star formation rate density as a function of redshift, the black hole mass versus uh, stellar mass correlation, all of these things are now reproduced in most hydrodynamical simulations of galaxy formation. And the important thing I want to note here is that AGN feedback is a key component in all of these simulations. So without AGN feedback, uh, what you're seeing here is the galaxy luminosity function. You can think about this as mass as well. Luminosity goes to this direction. And without AGN feedback, simulations tend to produce galaxies which are too massive. Their star formation rate is not shut off at the correct time, uh, producing too many massive galaxies, whereas with AGN feedback, we are able to reproduce uh, the galaxy luminosity or mass function. So all of these uh, simulations now employ some sort of AGN feedback process. Uh, in some cases, multiple. And the important number to keep in mind that in all of these simulations, there is a requirement that uh, the energy that is carried out by the wind from the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, this energy will be a significant fraction of the AGN energy. Uh, usually, the number is between 5 to 10 percent. So the bolometric luminosity of the AGN uh, it is required that 5 to 10 percent of this energy will be carried out by winds from uh, the center of the galaxy. And without that, we are unable to reproduce the observed properties of galaxies in simulations. Do we observe it? Um, so what you're seeing here, this is a literature compilation done by Fiore et al of all the known outflows in active galaxies up until 2017. And what I'm showing you here is the energy that is carried out by the outflow divided by the AGN energy, the AGN luminosity. And I mark here the 10% uh, requirement by uh, hydrodynamical simulations. Now, at this stage, I want to note that this compilation is based on multiple different studies targeting the most extreme outflow cases in the local universe. And what you can see here is that the peak of this distribution, basically most of the sources uh, in this sample, do not reach the theoretical requirement of 10%. Now, this compilation I'm showing you here is based on all of these papers, so tens of papers, each such work targeting a few nearby luminous sources showing extreme outflow signatures. I'm showing this in order to, first of all, uh, uh, explain that this histogram, which may look uh, a bit uh, not exciting, is based on a lot of work, on many, many years of work with the largest telescopes in the world. And secondly, I know that in order to explain that no general selection criterion have been applied when forming this histogram. So these sources here are a compilation of many, many sources of different evolutionary stages selected via different methods, and by no means they represent a, popul a well-defined population of sources in the local universe. 
So this was uh, basically uh, where we were at in 2017. Uh, and in this talk, I will try to do sort of an inventory of outflows in active galaxies in the local universe. I will explain how we uh, detect and characterize them, in which phases we detect these outflows, in which types of galaxies. And the attempt or the goal in this talk is to try and count all the different phases and understand how much energy is carried out by all the winds that we're seeing. In a similar fashion uh, to when people counted variants in galaxies, trying to understand how many variants are there and where they're at, here we're trying to count outflow energy. And I'll first, uh, I, 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 I show here uh, two possible geometries of outflows in galaxies. There may be uh, many more geometries, but just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, here, for example, I'm imagining a case where I have these gas uh, cones outflowing outwards from the galaxy, uh, whereas here I have a case where I have much smaller clouds or a filling factor which is much smaller than one of, again, uh, gas that flows out of galaxies. And the typical way with which we detect and characterize these outflows is using spectroscopy, either absorption or emission lines. Here I'm showing an example with an emission line where, again, if I have this outflowing cone and the observer is here, some of the gas uh, will emit emission which will be blue shifted with respect to the systemic velocity of the stars in the galaxy. And some of the gas uh, will emit redshifted emission with respect to systemic. So in general, what I expect to see when I'm looking at spectroscopy of galaxies is some narrow component originating from non-outflowing gas in the galaxy, gas that basically moves with the stars in the galaxy. Um, and I expect to see some blue shifted and redshifted emission uh, originating from these outflowing clouds. So this is how I usually detect uh, these outflows. And then my goal is to estimate the outflow energy. And the outflow energy depends on different uh, properties of the wind. Some of them are uh, directly observed. The line strength, so either the line luminosity or the uh, absorption equivalent width. The wind velocity, which can be extracted from the Doppler shift from uh, the emission or absorption. And the wind extent. Uh, basically, how large is the wind or what is the distance of this wind from the uh, center of the galaxy? Uh, this can be obtained using spatially resolved observations, either integral field units or sliding slits. Um, but I need to have an estimate of this outflow extent. <coughs> In addition to that, this outflow energy depends on several model-dependent properties. Uh, the ionization or excitation state of the gas, and the gas density. Uh, these two properties can usually be extracted if we have multiple transitions in which we detect these outflows and coupled to some photoionization model or some assumption about uh, the physics uh, of the gas. So if I have all of these, I can estimate the outflow energy. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is the outflow discovery space where I divide, I, the y-axis here is the phase of the outflow or the gas temperature uh, showing the cold molecular, neutral atomic and warm ionized. And here in the x-axis I divide it to different types of systems and I will explain why uh, this is important. Um, <clears throat> so at lower redshifts, if we're interested in the cold molecular outflow, we usually use arrays, millimeter interferometric arrays, such as ALMA or NOEMA, and we will usually uh, target emission lines uh, like the carbon uh, monoxide CO emission line. What you're seeing here is the integrated emission. You can see it, uh, the, the spatial extent of this CO emission within a galaxy. And if we integrate over this entire uh, region, we obtain an emission line. And this emission line can be decomposed into a narrow component uh, originating from non-outflowing gas and some 
broader component showing blue shifted, uh, blue shifted or red shifted uh, emission, which is interpreted as molecular outflows. Okay, Th this is how the community is interpreting and detecting uh, molecular outflows. Now, the important thing to note is that these kinds of outflows are detected towards extreme sources, primarily towards extreme sources. What you're seeing here, this is the star formation rate versus stellar mass diagram of galaxies in the local universe. Uh, the contours that you're seeing here, the black ones, show where most of the galaxies in the local universe lie. And there are two main classes. The first are the star forming galaxies located here, showing a correlation between their star formation rate and their stellar mass. And we have here the quiescent uh, galaxies which form little stars and are rather massive. <coughs> now the important thing to note, note is that the points here are the sources in which we detect cold molecular outflows. And you can see that most of these detections are outside the star forming main sequence. So they are primarily detected in sources that show extreme star formation rates. So these are luminous infrared galaxies, uh, ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. We're talking about gas-rich systems uh, in which the current sensitivity of uh, the millimeter arrays we're working with allows the detection of these broad components. So the detection, the, the cold molecular outflows are mostly limited to uh, the extreme galaxies and they do not trace a population of typical galaxies in the local universe. Moving on to the neutral atomic phase, uh, in the local universe, this is usually done using the, uh, the sodium absorption doublet. Here I'm showing you an example spectrum where the two dashed lines here represent the systemic velocity of the two doublet components. And what you can see is this, bro uh, is this broad blue shifted absorption, which again is attributed to neutral atomic outflows in the system. And again, here, we need spatially resolved information uh, using, for example, integral field unit data in order to trace this blue shifted absorption and understand what is the extent of the wind in the system. Finally, uh, we have the warm ionized phase, uh, which is traced by multiple emissions in the optical spectrum of galaxies. The O3, H alpha, H beta, the typical emission lines uh, in optical spectra of galaxies, where again we're looking for this either red shifted or blue shifted broad components, and that, uh, this is how we detect these outflows. And using integral field unit uh, data, uh, we can identify the extent of the wind. Here I'm showing you the grayscale uh, image represents the non outflowing uh, gas in the galaxy whereas the uh, blue and red contours represent gas that is blue shifted or red shifted with respect to systemic uh, and is identified as an outflow. So we see both of the cones of this outflow in this case. So this is what we do uh, at uh, redshift close to zero. Now one might argue that I should go and study AGN feedback and AGN winds at a redshift of two to three. And why is that? So if we look at the star formation rate cosmic uh, density, we see that there is the peak in the star formation rate uh, cosmic density at a redshift of around two to three. This is where most of the stars uh, formed in the galaxy. This is where the black hole accretion rate peaked as well. So any type of feedback, any type of correlation, I hope to induce using this AGN feedback should have been uh, put in place at a redshift of close to, uh, to two to three. This is the range. So why am I talking about low redshift? Why I'm not showing you things, uh, these winds at high redshift? So I think all of you know that, but uh, I, I still want to, to give you this example so uh, you will have uh, some, some sort of uh, uh, a, a picture uh, when we keep uh, discussing these outflows. Uh, this is what happens when I move from a redshift zero galaxy to a redshift two to three galaxy. What you're seeing here on the left, this is a spectrum obtained using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so a 2.5 meter telescope 
for 45 minutes of on-source exposure. Uh, what you're seeing here is the age alpha and the two nitrogen two lines, and the signal-to-noise ratio is exquisite. It is very easy for me to separate the narrow, uh, the narrow uh, lines from the broad lines. Um, and here what I'm showing you, this is a redshift roughly two galaxy observed with MOSFIRE uh, KEK for two hours. So one of the largest telescopes in the world for two hours with one of the most sensitive uh, instruments. And this is what the same region in rest frame uh, wavelength looks like. Now, it is not completely fair, this comparison, because here uh, we're observing uh, in optical wavelengths, whereas here we observe in near-infrared wavelengths in order to get the optical uh, uh, rest frame. So it's not completely fair. Near-infrared observations are much more challenging. But what I hope you can appreciate from this diagram is that when I go to higher redshift, it becomes increasingly challenging to separate uh, the component, which I believe is the non-outflowing gas in the galaxy, from the component originating from the outflow. In addition to that, while in low redshifts, I'm able, due to the sensitivity and the signal to noise, I'm able to detect these outflowing components in multiple transitions. At higher redshifts, I'm only able to do that for the strongest emission lines. And why is this important? Because my goal is to estimate the wind's energy. And it depends on these two properties, the ionization state and the gas density. And when I move to higher redshift, I do not, I'm, in many cases, I'm not able to detect enough transitions, enough emission lines where I see this outflow to derive the gas ionization state and the gas density. So what we typically do, we use local observations where we have constrained the ionization state and gas density and simply assume that this is the ionization state and gas density at higher redshift. So you can imagine that the estimates we get at this high uh, redshift are pretty uh, uncertain because we do not really have these two properties. Now, an important thing I want to note is that here I focused on uh, rest frame optical emission lines and AGN galaxies at this redshift because I'm interested in AGN winds. There has been a lot of work done on absorption, on outflows seen in absorption in star forming galaxies at this redshift, but I ignore all of that because I uh, am trying to uh, discuss AGN feedback, but there is a significant amount of work that has been done on star forming galaxies at this redshift uh, in absorption. Okay, so given that, I want to argue that it does make sense to spend some time understanding what happens locally, where we have the signal to noise, where we have the sensitivity to observe these outflows with different phases um, and to understand what is going on before moving to higher redshift where uh, things are less certain. So this is the diagram I showed you before, uh, which is based on all of these phases I've shown you uh, in uh, the previous slides. The cold molecular, neutral atomic, ionized outflows. So tens of studies targeted uh, these extreme sources using different IFU uh, instruments and different slits, obtaining uh, this uh, uh, distribution that you're seeing here. Um, and I will now uh, show you a few advances that we made in this field and a few surprises uh, that we got during our studies. Um, and the first one is um, estimating the extent of the outflow without the need uh, of IFU observations. So in some sense, one of the bottlenecks uh, in studies of outflows uh, has been the requirement of observing these outflows with integral field units. Since I'm breaking the light to many spatial resolution elements, I need deeper exposures to reach sufficient uh, signal-to-noise ratio. This limits the number of sources I can observe and uh, the, uh, the, the, the type of sources I can observe. So what we did in this work, 
uh, was to realize, uh, this is obviously not, uh, not a discovery by us, but uh, we realized that the outflows uh, in active galaxies are dusty. So dust is mixed with the ionized neutral or uh, molecular outflow, and this dust is exposed to the AGN radiation. If this dust will be closer to the AGN, it will be hotter. If it will be farther away from the AGN, it will be colder. So if we're able to detect this dust in emission, we will be able to say something about the distance of this dust from the central source. The dust emits gray body radiation, so if we're able to detect it in mid-infrared wavelengths, we can derive its temperature, and from its temperature, we can estimate the distance of this dust from the central source. And since we believe that this dust is mixed with the outflow, it gives us a way to estimate the outflow extent, the distance of this outflow. So <clears throat> the first thing that we did is to uh, uh, obtain stacked spectral energy distributions of active galaxies with and without outflows. What you're seeing here uh, is stacked spectral energy distributions of local AGN, uh, where this is uh, the optical and near-infrared wavelengths, these are the mid-infrared, and this is the far-infrared. And in these stacks, we controlled uh, all the properties we're not interested in. So these stacks are based on uh, samples with similar stellar masses, similar star formation rates, similar AGN luminosity. So the only thing that is different between the sources in the uh, black uh, line and the red line is the presence of ionized outflows detected in optical. And what you're seeing here is an excess of mid-infrared emission seen in the stacked SCD of sources showing ionized outflows. We attribute this excess to dust that is mixed with the outflow heated by the AGN emitting uh, in mid-infrared wavelengths. After finding it in stacked SCDs, we started performing SCD decomposition of thousands of galaxies, um, obtaining, basically fitting this uh, uh, component of a dusty outflow, gray body emission originating from the outflow. And once we get the dust temperature, it is uh, rather easy to get the distance of this dust from the AGN, given that the AGN luminosity is known, because dust is simply a bolometer. So if you put it closer, it will be hotter. If you put it farther away, it will be colder. So this allowed us to estimate the luminosity weighted location of the outflow in thousands of active galaxies. Now, every such estimate is less certain than the estimates you get from IFU observations. It's luminosity weighted, and there are several assumptions that go into uh, the, the SCD decomposition that we're doing. But we lose in our accuracy, but win in our numbers. We now have thousands of systems where we have this luminosity weighted extent. And I will note that for uh, a handful of these, we also have IFU observations, so we can compare the actual extent to the one that derived from uh, the SED fitting, and these are consistent uh, to a factor of three. We look at the whole galaxy. So this we convinced ourselves uh, using the stack, stack analysis. So in the stack analysis, we divided our uh, sample uh, to, to sources that show ionized outflows in optical and sources that do not show, while controlling for all the properties we believe that affect the infrared emission uh, seen in galaxies. So we control for the stellar mass, meaning that here, uh, we're controlling for the near-infrared emission that we're seeing. We're controlling for star formation rate. So uh, here we're controlling for the far-infrared uh, emission. And we're controlling for the AGN luminosity. So both of these average sources have the same AGN luminosity, stellar mass, and star formation rate. So we do not expect an additional component, an additional emission, 
coming from large-scale heating of uh, stationary, let's say, non-outflowing dust in the galaxy. And we confirmed it using s very, deep, uh, very um, varying stacks. So in low masses, high masses, high star formation rates, low star formation rates. Um, so this is how we convinced ourselves that this property, uh, this emission originates from dust in the wind. The question is which wind? whether an ionized, a neutral uh, molecular, there is some uncertainty there. Uh, I, I hope that offline I can convince you why uh, this, is, uh, this originates from ionized outflows, uh, but there is some uncertainty uh, in this regard. Okay, um, the second thing that we did is to estimate the electron density of these outflowing clouds. The electron density uh, is a very important property and we need to have uh, such an estimate if we wish to estimate the energy that is carried out by these outflows. <coughs> and basically the picture that I have in mind is of this outflowing cloud that you're seeing here exposed to the AGN radiation. So this outflowing cloud at the front will be completely ionized, but at some point if the column density is high enough, uh, all the ionizing photons will be absorbed and I will reach the neutral part of the cloud, okay? Um, and obviously, uh, if I plot the electron density as a function of depth into the cloud, the electron density drops. Here, the gas is ionized, so the electron density is roughly the hydrogen density in the cloud, whereas as I reach the neutral part of the cloud, I have more and more neutral species, the electron density drops. And typically, to estimate the electron density in these outflows, uh, in optical, people have been using the sulfur-2 doublet. Um, so the intensity ratio of these two sulfur-2 uh, components varies with electron density uh, in the cloud, and this is because the critical density of these two sulfur transitions is within this region here, okay? It's close to uh, 2,000 or something per cube. So the intensity ratio varies with electron density. So what was classically done was to decompose the sulfur two, extract the, the, uh, the luminosity of these outflowing components, and then using their intensity ratio, estimate the electron density in the cloud. What we found out is that if you study the ionization state of the cloud using the multiple transitions in which we detect these emission lines, what we found is that the region that contains sulfur plus, so the gas that will actually emit sulfur two radiation, the sulfur plus is located close to the ionization uh, front of the cloud, so close to the neutral part. And it will trace gas uh, with a very low electron density. Whereas most of the cloud, most of the mass, uh, actually contains sulfur plus plus uh, and will emit sulfur three. Um, and if we'll actually estimate the electron density from this region, we get a much larger value compared to what is typically estimated using the sulfur two lines. Uh, for those of you who are interested uh, in the details, I will note it in, in like uh, 30 seconds, but please come and ask me after the talk if you're interested in it. But in order to do such an inference, the first thing that we need to do is to detect the outflow in multiple emission lines. Once we have these multiple emission lines, we can use photoionization models to estimate the key property of these outflows called the ionization parameter. It tells us uh, the degree of ionization of the gas. And given this degree of ionization, we can ask what is the ionization structure uh, and what is the ionic fraction of different species. And from that, we see that it is simply impossible to have the emission lines that we measure at the, at the distance we think the outflow is at with the electron density we have. In fact, in order to reproduce the emission lines that we see in these galaxies, we need this gas to be outside of the galaxy. If this is indeed, if the sulfur two is the indeed uh, correct density to use. And this has a significant uh, implication to the, esti to the estimated energy of these flows the energy and the mass of these outflows 
depend linearly on the electron density. So if up until now we have underestimated the electron density by a factor of 100, it means that we overestimated the mass and the energy by a factor of 100. So this is significant. Um, the last thing that we did is to constrain the neutral gas fraction of these outflowing clouds. Up until now, we mostly were able to estimate the gas that is in this region. So the gas in the ionized part emits all the optical emission lines that we see. Um, and the part here, the neutral uh, gas at the back of these clouds, was essentially invisible to us. But what we realized is that dust is mixed throughout the entire cloud and will emit infrared radiation covering the entire cloud, not only the ionized part. So by combining the line emission that we see in optical originating from the ionized gas with the infrared emission of this newly detected component, we could give a rough estimate uh, of the neutral part of this cloud. And what we found is that it is a factor of a few larger in mass than the ionized part. So in some sense, up until now, we saw the tip of the iceberg. We saw the tiny little ionized part traced by the optical emission lines, but this thing actually carries a much more significant amount of gas in a neutral phase, which we were unable to see before. So taking all of this into account, I'm coming back to this diagram here, and these uh, new methods allowed us to estimate the energy that is carried out by these winds towards a very large and representative population of local active galaxies. And this is what you, you can see here. Uh, these are the extreme galaxies showing the extreme outflow properties, whereas the distribution that we're obtaining is uh, the distribution here. Um, and it is based on the methods I've shown you up until now. Some of them are less accurate than IFU observations. Uh, we were able to put an uncertainty on our estimates, but now we're able to, to do that for thousands of galaxies. And yes, it does. Sorry. Um, and I will just note that, uh, so one thing that we see here is that the peak of uh, the distribution here is roughly three orders of magnitude lower than the theoretical requirement by hydrodynamical simulations. Um, and similar conclusions are being reached by many different uh, studies. It, is, uh, it becomes more and more apparent using either IFUs or other uh, methods like the, one, like the ones I've shown you here, that the energy carried out by outflows in local active galaxies is order of magnitude, orders of magnitude lower than what is currently implemented in models. Um, so if I need to sum up what we know about typical galaxies, uh, we were able to obtain a census of the warm ionized and the neutral atomic uh, phases uh, of these outflows. As for the cold molecular, as I told you uh, previously, uh, we are currently mostly tracing uh, the, co uh, the cold molecular outflows in extreme systems. But we do have several measurements in typical star forming, uh, typical uh, galaxies, and Combining this with upper limits we have for a large population of sources, we, we can uh, constrain the, the cold molecular outflow as well. And the conclusion we're reaching once we uh, add up all these different phases is that uh, the energy is orders of magnitude lower. So now we'll go to extreme sources where the star formation rate is elevated, the black hole accretion rate is elevated, and perhaps the outflow properties that we're seeing are uh, significantly different. Uh, so what you're seeing here, this is again the star formation rate versus stellar mass diagram. Uh, most of the galaxies lie either here or here. This is the star forming main sequence, quiescent galaxies. And when I say extreme galaxies, I mean galaxies that show star formation rates much higher uh, with respect to their stellar mass compared to the regular galaxy population. And there are two uh, types of classes I uh, want to consider. One of them are infrared luminous galaxies. 
these are systems that if we look at their uh, images, we see uh, many of them are major mergers. They show disturbed morphologies. They show extreme star formation rates. They are dusty, molecular gas rich. Some of them show significant black hole accretion. Um, so this is one population of sources. The second population of sources are post-starburst galaxies, uh, which are believed to be sources starting here and then quenching abruptly uh, over a time scale of a few hundred mega years. Uh, I particularly like these sources. Uh, as I said, some of them are here, whereas some are, are moving uh, down in this diagram very fast. And we know that from their optical spectrum, uh, that is dominated by intermediate age stars, suggesting a recent starburst that was quenched abruptly. And in order to trace the multi-phase nature of these flows in these systems, we really need a multi-wavelength approach, starting from very high energies in the X-ray to, uh, to trace the AGN in these very dusty systems, going through optical observations in order to spatially resolve the warm ionized and the neutral atomic uh, outflows up until millimeter arrays to constrain the cold molecular uh, phase. Uh, the reason why I'm showing that is to explain that this takes years. Uh, this is a very significant effort by tens of people in the community attempting to build uh, representative samples of such sources and constrain the different outflow properties. And because uh, this is Caltech and my colloquium, I will show one example with KCWI just to show you how well we can constrain the outflow if we have sensitive and deep observations of a uh, source. What you're seeing here is a post starburst galaxy observed during the commissioning of KCWI. I think it was for 20 minutes of exposure time. Um, and so we're obtaining a spectrum for every spatial resolution element in the galaxy. What we see here is the stellar continuum emission in the galaxy. This is color coded by uh, white to black, where the last contour here, the orange one, represents the region beyond which we no longer detect stars. If instead we look at the line emission traced here by O3, we detect gas to distances of 17 kiloparsecs. Now the amazing thing about taking an instrument such as KCWI on a large telescope as Keck is that I'm getting every little rectangle you see here in the diagram is a spectrum where I detect five different emission lines. I detect O3, I detect H beta, H gamma, helium 2, and all of this information in a spatially resolved manner allows me to build a very detailed and well-constrained photoionization model where I have to reproduce all the line luminosities, all the line ratios, the dust extinction that I'm seeing. And in this particular source, our modeling suggests an outflow with a mass of roughly uh, 10 to the 9 solar masses, which we believe is an order of magnitude larger than all the gas mass within the galaxy. So this is what detailed observations can allow us to do. Um, now, integrating over many uh, different works, uh, some of these are, uh, are a collection of other many works. What we see here is, again, the distribution of outflow energy uh, divided by the AGN energy for molecular outflows in infrared luminous galaxies and uh, ionized the neutral outflows in post starburst galaxies compared to the 10% that is required by simulation. And again, you can see, if I'm asking where 50% of the sources lie, they lie roughly one order of magnitude below what is implemented in models. And another complicated fact that I completely ignored up until now is that some of these outflows are actually star formation driven. I haven't removed any outflows that are driven by supernovae. These are extreme sources showing star formation rates of tens of solar masses per year. Uh, we expect supernova feedback to be dramatic in these sources. So this is before correcting for the energy that is injected to these flows by supernovae. So coming back to this diagram here, uh, we're able to uh, uh, obtain a census of local extreme galaxies with AGN. And we find that the energy that is carried out by these flows is roughly uh, a factor of 10 lower than what is implemented in models. So we can ask the question, where is the missing energy? 
Um, and one phase I completely ignored up until now is the extremely ionized phase. So when thinking about galactic flows, if I'm launching a wind within a galaxy, this wind is expected to encounter the interstellar medium, getting shock heated uh, to high temperatures and extremely ionized phase. This wind will not be traced by the, uh, the phases I've shown you here. And it will be in a much more uh, hot and ionized phase. What I'm showing you here is a wind uh, detected in X-ray absorption, believed to originate from gas moving at a velocity of 50,000 kilometers per second, uh, extremely ionized gas uh, of ionization potentials between 1,000 and 2,000. And the reason why I haven't uh, included that in our inventory is that winds such as these are detected towards uh, a few sources, the few brightest AGN we have in the local universe. So this is not something we can apply to uh, typical galaxies or even extreme galaxies in the local universe. Now, this, the exciting thing is that uh, JWST, with its instrument, will actually give us a way to trace this extremely ionized phase in galaxies through near-infrared and mid-infrared observations. What you're seeing here are the wavelengths covered by NIRSPEC IFU and MIRI uh, MRS uh, IFU. And I'm showing you here different transitions originating from extremely ionized gas. You can see the ionization potential here, um, which are expected to be detected in galaxies. And the important thing to note is that the warm ionized phase I've shown you up until now, the oxygen-3, for example, the ionization potential of this uh, transition is 35 electron volt. So what you're seeing here is a completely different parameter space, which we now will be able to explore on a very large scale with J, uh, JWST. Uh, what I'm showing you here is an example of such a detection by Lee Armos using uh, MIRI uh, MRS observations in mid-infrared. And what you're seeing here are multiple ionization transitions in which this outflow was detected uh, towards a rather luminous, uh, luminous infrared galaxy with an AGN. And the amazing thing in my eyes is that this was obtained using 20 minutes of exposure time with MIRI MRS. This means that such observations will, uh, will be, uh, will be, we will be able to perform such observations for a population of local galaxies which are less extreme and less luminous than this one and obtaining a census of this highly ionized phase. Another thing that is going to happen is that now using the sensitivity of uh, JWST, we will be able to detect rest frame optical transitions in these high redshift, uh, redshift two to three sources with signal to noise ratios rivaling the ones that we have now uh, in local galaxies. And then we can use all of the things we learned at low redshift. Some of them I mark here because I showed you, other things that we learned that I didn't show you, but now we can use all of that in order to interpret what we're seeing here uh, in a more accurate fashion. Um, so I'll summarize. Uh, we believe that galactic flows are a critical process in galaxy evolution, shaping the growth of the galaxy and its evolution as a function of time. Uh, AGN feedbacks, in, par in, in particular AGN-driven outflows, are, are now a key ingredient in uh, simulations of galaxy formation. Without it, we do not reproduce the properties of local active galaxies. Uh, the community has reached a point where we have a census of the multi-phased uh, warm ionized neutral atomic and cold molecular outflow phases in local active galaxies, both typical and, active, uh, and extreme. And we see that there is an energy missing. Uh, in typical galaxies, three to four orders of magnitude. In extreme galaxies, a factor of roughly 10. And one possible way to reconcile it is that we actually didn't, up until now, we have not been detecting the dominant outflow phase. Most of this outflow may be in an extremely hot and ionized phase, but 
it's nice because now with uh, JWST, we will be able to trace this phase in a large population of local active galaxies. And in addition to that, start doing uh, studies uh, of redshift 2 AGN uh, in rest frame optical wavelengths with r roughly similar signal to noise ratios to what uh, we, we had uh, here at redshift 0. Uh, thank you very much. So it depends on whether you're asking uh, observationally or, uh, or theoretically. Obser observationally. So there are only a handful of sources in which we detect this extremely ionized outflow, uh, either through these X-ray absorption lines that uh, I've shown you, or a few near-infrared uh, observations using a symphony or, Rosi or Rosiris of very local and luminous sources where we see these corona lines. And then in these sources, we see that the extremely ionized phase is more massive and carries much more energy than the other phases. But we know this for five sources, for the five most extreme sources in the local universe. Uh, it may be the case that we will not find this uh, outflow component to be the dominant one in typical galaxies or in other extreme sources. So we still do not have the statistics to know whether this is something that will be a general conclusion. Right, and, and this is why the hope is to be able to detect them in multiple transitions. If you're able to detect these lines in multiple transitions, if, and even so to spatially resolve them, which uh, the JWST instrument will, uh, instruments will allow you, you can couple this with a photoionization model, where you basically have the ionization structure, you know the AGN luminosity, you know the distance of this gas from the central source, and you see several components, several emission lines tracing different ionization energies. You can build a model which will give you uh, consistent emission line luminosities, and from that infer the, uh, the correction, the ionization correction. But you're completely right. With one emission line, uh, it is very uncertain and almost impossible to say something about the mass of the full extremely ionized uh, wind component. You're asking what is this peak here? I suspect, but we still, 
we still aren't able to convince ourselves that we are able to clearly separate starburst driven from AGN driven wind. Right. That's, that's a very important comment. Uh, first of all, uh, th I, I think that this comment relates more to uh, typical active galaxies in which the black holes accrete at a, a small fraction of their Eddington luminosity. And then I can say, OK, then I do not expect, expect the winds to be super strong. They will not affect the galaxy because the accretion rate is very low. Here I'm talking about systems accreting at uh, close to 10% of the Eddington ratio, sometimes 30% of the Eddington ratio. So these are the local analogs of systems in redshift 2 to 3 where I expect the feedback uh, to take place. Uh, if in more than 50% of them I'm a factor of 10 shy, that's a problem. Uh, if this distribution was completely, uh, was very close to the 10%, uh, I, I would say, okay, this is viable. But given that more than 50% of these objects, which again are extreme sources, uh, if there I'm not able to find these winds, there is an issue. It is still true that things can be completely different at high redshifts. And it, we must study redshift 2 to 3 galaxies, but there is some advantage to start locally where we have the sensitivity and uh, the different wavelengths to, to tackle this problem from different directions. High mass and low mass galaxies. So all of these galaxies are in some sense, wh what do you call high mass? What is uh, your mass threshold? Mm? I don't know. I, 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 we can check it. I don't know. Above and below 10 to the 11, I'm not sure.